Good morning, Southside. A special greeting to any visitors who are with us this morning. We're always grateful to have you. Got the verdicts back. Sorry, we're in Philippians. I know your dad just preached through it. We're going to do it again. So Groundhog Day. Uh, beautiful. Um, wanted to bring to your attention uh, Austin and Claire Lease. This week, she will be going in for her stem cell transplant. So I wanted to ask if we could all be in special prayer uh, for her and the whole family uh, this week. And then I, Gordon and Josie are here with their little guy. I know he came a little early, but he looks fantastic. Congratulations. Good to have you guys. And to the grandparents, hallelujah. Nothing better. It's good. Thank you, Lord. Well, this morning, if you'll open up then to Philippians chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 18. Paul says in verse 12, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorian guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren turning in the Lord, uh, sorry, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for this section where Paul opens up his heart, and we see that what fills that heart is the Lord Jesus Christ by his Spirit. We see what fills his ambition is that name above all names. I pray, Lord, whatever you would have for us then in the word, that you would do mighty things in every heart. God, I pray for, for our um, addiction to interpret our circumstances by our own understanding. God, I ask that we would be set free to have your eyes of what you bring into our lives and why and how you use them. God, I pray for freedom for the children of God this morning. I pray for the Dickens. I thank you, Lord, that you have brought them here to worship. I thank you that in the middle of this trial, they never became angry. They trusted you. They hurt deeply and they grieve. Please be with them. Let this church help them in their grief journey and process. Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, would you touch their hearts and continue healing the hole that they feel and the pain. Be with that sweet family, I pray, Jesus. I pray now, let us worship you for the words that are before us. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, the title of this chapter is The Fellowship of the gospel, the beauty of what we share as the children of God. And we've been looking at an outline, and in verses 3 through 8, we saw that we're to put the fellowship of the gospel at the center of our relations with one another, that we have koinonia in the gospel together, and we're partakers of grace together, and that there's this beautiful bond, and that should be the, the center of our relations together. Last week on Mother's Day, we looked that we're to put the priorities of the gospel at the center of your prayer life. And I just pray you keep meditating on that and praying over it. There is just so much um, beauty and depth and richness, but that we keep growing in discerning love. The, the longer I live is I just, the, the, even the gift of mercy, you can just run in and, and actually hurt people with even your mercy if it's not growing. And how do I help people? How do I love people truly? So we're, we're growing in the word of God and we're, we're learning more and more how to let our love abound greater and greater. What a joyful process to bring glory to our God. So put the priorities of the gospel at the center of our prayer life. And now this morning in verses 12 through 18, 
Paul's going to teach us to put the priorities of the gospel at the center of your circumstances, at the center of your life. And so we're going to see that in verses 12 through 18. And I just want to begin with the question, how do I not be a slave to my circumstances? They just feel so sovereign to me. And and this has been my 35-year battle is how do I not interpret what's good, what's bad, um, God's love toward me? I'm such a circumstance junkie that I I look at that to to teach me about how I view God, how I view my life. And we're going to see something completely different this morning. How How do I not let circumstances be the dictator of my joy and my sorrow? How can I not be so wavering in my life by my circumstances. And this has truly been one of my greatest battles since 1987. And just, is there a way to be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? Is there there a way to rejoice in the Lord always? And again, I say rejoice when my circumstances are hard or just not what I wanted for my life or what I thought it would be. Do I have to be a slave to my circumstances that I find myself in this morning to to dictate what my attitude is, my spirit, my heart, as I sit here this morning in my jail cell, name it, whatever it is, can I find peace? Can I find joy and contentment? And so Paul is going to go deep to show us why is he rejoicing, how we can rejoice And what is the mindset that I must have about life and death to be able to turn my circumstances into joy and opportunities for the gospel of Jesus Christ? To not view my circumstances as the obstacles to my life, as we saw in that chart, but stepping stones to conformity to God and the advancement of his kingdom. F.B. Meyer said, unbelief sees God through circumstances as we sometimes see the sun shorn of his rays through the smoky air, but faith puts God between itself and circumstances and looks at them through him. The ability to to have God now be the interpreter of our circumstances and how to think about them and how to respond to them. What is before us this morning is big. And I want to dig in together and ask God to make a paradigm shift in all of our hearts and our thinking, trying to control our circumstances and be God to really enter into Romans 8, 28, that we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. How do I really enter in to that truth and to that verse? That's where we're going to go this morning. And so I want to give you just a little warning label. You ever had those on your medications or something? This cause, this may cause great pain this morning. It might cause conviction and confrontation, but the peace and joy that it can bring is is abundant. So I'm a minister for your joy this morning. I might step on your toes, but what I'm trying to do is, is lead you to joy in your life and in the circumstances that God has brought to you even this morning. So Prepare for the scalpel. Ask God to do surgery on your heart. And don't let pride explain it away. Let the scripture open you up and just show you what is at the center of your aspirations. What control, what, what control do your circumstances have over your life? And you'll quickly find out what is the center of your aspirations by how you respond to the circumstances that God is bringing into them. And maybe that's where I want to begin. Just ask yourself, what is at the center of your aspirations? As you sit here this morning, what, what is it that you want from life? What is it? Don't just give the Sunday school answer. What is it that you want from this life? What do you want out of life more than anything else? What, what do you want for your kids? More than anything else will show your aspirations. Is our, our, is our goal to just be healthy and, and live long? Is it to be married and raise a family? Is it a good retirement? To be the top in your field? Maybe to make your husband love you or to get into the inner circle? I just want to ask all my sweet little kids. I love having the children in the worship service. So I want to talk to you for a second. I just want to ask you, what, 
What little kids do you want out of life? It's a good question to ask, even at five years of age. Is it just, I'd like a later bedtime. I, I, wish, I wish I was old enough to pick how much candy I could eat. When I'm 18 and I move out, I'll be able to eat as much candy as you want, and you'll find out you can't. <laughs> I just want to be a fireman or a little princess. And so I just want to ask the children even as well, what, what do you want out of this life? This is such a crucial question to answer in all honesty to our God. I've spent quite a bit of time trying to answer this question truthfully. Not what I want it to be, but what is it? What is my ambition in life and death? Remaining sin is a deceitful thing, but there are ways to test it. So how is it going this morning? Are you up? Are you down? Are you high? Are you low? Why? I would like to ask. I was thinking about a thermometer. Thermometers can't do much. They can only go up or down. And what makes it do this is a very limited stimulus, just the sun. Nothing else affects it. Uh, You can yell at your thermometers. The Broncos can lose, um, which happens often. (laughs) You, You could work hard hours and all these things, and it will not be affected but by one thing, the sun. And so I just want to ask that. What is the single factor that causes the rising and the falling of my disposition? What is the principled thing that I'm tied to on this earth? What makes my thermometer go up and down? Maybe I'm sitting here dry spiritually, and just to ask yourself, why is it hard circumstance? Life took a turn that you didn't want. You're not feeling fulfilled in your job. You, you had a baby. the gospel. Even he's writing from Rome, and in Rome he said, I'm eager to come and preach the gospel. I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God for salvation for all who believe. I'm eager to preach this gospel, and now I'm imprisoned. Your life is tied to that. You've got to be so disheartened. You're a fish out of water sitting in a prison cell. All the deprivation and suffering that goes with that, Paul, I thought you said, God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life, not in this prison. (coughs) Paul, the mouthpiece of God, is chained in a prison to a soldier in the city that he wants to preach. And I just want to observe Paul this morning. Is he despairing? Do his his hard circumstances have him just ready to give up? And I want you to see in verse 12, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. And then in verse 18, he closes in triumph. How am I doing? I'm rejoicing. How could this be? His circumstances are awful. And at the end of the sermon, I'm going to try to balance out. I want to make sure you understand grief is an important part of our journey. But I'm talking about this understanding of letting your circumstances just own you and dictate you. And in this, this passage, I've, I've studied it before, but I sit here longing for this mindset to take up my entire being and my aspirations. We're moving into your hearts this morning. What is your chief aspiration? And I think what I'm seeing is why is Paul not in despair It's available to every one of you this morning. This isn't just something special for apostles. Paul's going to tell you in this section that I have a definition of life and death, the way I think about it, that enables me to face every circumstance with a profound trust in God. I I have learned the secret. My circumstance, they're not what define me, but how I view life, my world, and my life view that controls me 
It is not wavering. It's a ballast to his soul. It's an anchor. It's a strong tower. It's a refuge. As the psalmist said, it's a very present help in the time of trouble. Thank you, God. So what is life, Paul? What am I living for? What is the most important thing? And we're going to flush that out, but I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert. Plug your ears if you don't want to hear it. Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And we're going to take one Sunday on that. But Paul's going to say, my life is one thing, one central thing in all my aspirations, to know Christ and to make him known. That's what drives me. That's my end game. And I can look now at these circumstances and I can go to my chief aspiration and this is all working together for what I really long for and desire. It's no longer about me. I've been crucified with Christ. I see that what is central to me, Paul says, is advancing. My circumstances only matter to me in that they advance this gospel. Just look at verse 12. <clears throat> he just says, now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances, and he gives no details. I know this is going to frustrate some of you. I like circumstances. More than likely, the Philippians were wanting more details. And Paul doesn't give hardly any. There's something more pressing, more important, he's saying, than even my circumstances and, and, and how many of us think this way? Because what floats the, the boat for most of our lives is just my circumstances. And, they, and I, I'm, I'm telling you, they do matter, but they need to be seen rightly and understood from God's perspective. I've seen people with tears coming down their face from their circumstances, and they trust God, but the circumstances bring that about. That is most of our problem, is, is what is central to our aspirations. This is what I'm asking. Is it your circumstances? Is that what is central to your heart, your circumstances, as viewed from my lens and not from God's? So the central thing is how I think about life, what I need, what I want, what God should do. That's what dictates my life. And anything that comes across it then is, is uh, I despair. So that's what he's trying to bring us into. That there's a way out from this kind of thinking. And that's what I want to do this morning now is go mining in this passage, saying, God, how do I, how do I get to where Paul is in this? I've, I've been seeking it for 35 years. J.A. Uh, Moyer, he said, what happened began in Acts 21, 17, when the apostles set foot in Jerusalem. And as he went in, he was forewarned by the Holy Spirit that bonds and afflictions and imprisonment await him there. An entirely false accusation is leveled at him by his own people in verse 21, 28. He's nearly lynched by a religious mob. He ended up in the Roman prison, having escaped flogging only by pleading citizenship in verse 22. His whole case was beset by a mockery of justice. For though all right was on his side, he couldn't even secure a hearing. He was made the subject of unjust and unprovoked insult and shame, malicious misrepresentation in 24.5, a deadly plot in 23.12, and he was kept imprisoned owing to official craving for popularity and for money. He was brought to Rome bound by a chain and destined to drag out uh, the last two years under house arrest uh, with the uncertainty of an earthly crazy king. We struggle with evil and suffering and injustice. I know there's many that sit here this morning stuck in those things. And Paul says, these are not the things at the center of my heart and my aspirations. What is central to my heart is that the gospel progresses. The adversity has not squelched the gospel, but rather in joy, he's pushed it forward. He's going to say, you can't imprison the gospel. God can take trials and turn them into testimony. It's not like uh, this movie I, I watched called Facing the Giants. It just, everything in, in the end turns out perfect. That's not, that's not it. But the sufficiency of God and the spread of the gospel is what Paul's rejoicing in. He was always looking to see God's work 
and he saw these stumbling blocks as stepping stones. God, take out the scalpel and cut off the flesh that's grown over our hearts to make other American things central to our aspirations so that we're junkies to our own myoptic view of our own circumstances. Cut. Cut whatever you have to out of our hearts this morning that I've made an idol and have made central to the aspirations of my life. Purify our hearts, O God. Pray Philippians 1, 9 through 11. All right. Where was I? My circumstances. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So in light of Paul's circumstances, he's going to give you three elements then of why he is rejoicing. And that'll be our outline for this morning. So the first reason why Paul's rejoicing are the facts. And the facts are there is progress of the gospel. It's spreading. He says uh, the whole praetorian guard. This was the group who protected the head officials. They were Caesar's main men. They watched over the prisons as well, and I'm told that they were comprised of some 9,000 soldiers. What a congregation. (laughs) 9,000, what a mission field that Paul now has. And very unlikely that these gnarly dudes were going to attend the tent revivals. So God brought Paul to the soldiers. This is not normal prison ministry. I like coming home after prison ministry. And all of these men know that Paul is Christ's man. And every time he says they look at me, they think of Christ. They know I'm there, I'm in prison because of um, my hope and preaching of Jesus. He's there because of his faith in this one named Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. So my chains have chained me to Caesar's men. And we don't need everything to go well for the advance of the gospel. Most often, God uses hard circumstances to advance the gospel. That's how he works. That's what he uses, hard circumstances. Health, wealth, and prosperity is not the gospel advances. Quite the contrary. It just is not how he spreads it. Oh my, your, your, your hard, broken, hurting life does not disqualify you for gospel ministry. But it's your calling card. Prison. Philippians 1.6 doesn't stop. God is continuing a work in Paul in the advancement of the gospel. Uh, Pray for knowledge and discernment to approve the things that are excellent. And Paul's uh, thinking through this so well. Paul understands what he wrote in Romans 8.28. He gets that the circumstances of any kind are from God and can advance the gospel. We see that from the prison cell, that love is abounding from the Apostle Paul. And he just says that, uh, verse 12, it's, they've turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment and the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorium guard. And just this little phrase, and to everyone else. <laughs> just kind of dumps it in there. It's just spreading all over Rome. It's, it's, it's working. It's It's effective. And so I just want you to hear that the prison is advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And before we move on, I've got one question of the text. How does prison advance the gospel? It it just doesn't feel like it should. Here's the leader in Christianity. He's in prison for the cause of Christ. And he's waiting to find out if his head's going to be cut off or not. We'll see next week. And, and come, come sign up for that would end American Christianity, I think. Come sign up and get your head cut off for Jesus. Go to prison for the name of Christ. How many show up next Sunday? I think this is important. Why does that not stop it? Paul says, we're not peddling the word of God. I'm not selling anything. If you come to Christ, it's not your life's going to get better and easier and you will be healthier. But right up front, if you follow me, you'll have to take up your cross and die. You might go to jail. You might get your head cut off. Is the name of Jesus Christ worth that? Is it worth being rejected at work or in your families? Here's the cost. 
Here's what's before us with this apostle. It's not just some words being written. He's waiting here if he's going to die for the name of Christ. How does that advance the gospel? Well, we see that the praetorium guard is hearing of it. Felix, Festus, King Agrippa, it's going to spread and they're going to hear Secondly, Rome didn't know anything about Jesus, and now they're talking about him because Paul's in prison for faith in Christ. All, all to everyone else, it's spreading. But I think really important is it's spreading because someone is willing to die for the name of Jesus Christ. They're looking at Paul, and he's worth dying for. More than making your life easier. I think that would do wonders for our evangelism. They're willing to die for this. They're willing to sacrifice and give up everything for Christ. Not let me show you how much easier and better your life's going to be. We'll die for this name. Austin and Claire Lees were put on the cancer floor, and they said the darkness and depression on that floor is so heavy. And there were this little light shining with people taking notice of them not knowing their future, but trusting in Jesus Christ. That makes me want to know him. When I watch the Dickens worship Christ and their daughter was called home, it makes me want to know him, walk with him, and love him. So the gospel is spreading And it's also in verse 14, it's strengthening the saints. It's that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So his imprisonment brought courage to many believers. Just the terms in this passage, he says they're, they're trusting the Lord. They have far more courage to speak without fear. There's this amazing fruit that's going on there in, in, in Rome. So their courage to speak forth the truth, it went to new heights when it should have been intimidated. They should have been scared. They should have been shutting up. But instead, it was just the opposite. They're watching a man willing to die for Jesus Christ, and I, I'm getting strengthened by that. I'm getting more courage, more boldness. So do you see what you can do for each other? The people who are stepping out and sacrificing and being rejected can strengthen a whole body for the name of Christ. They saw Paul suffer for the gospel and it spread it. God's care for Paul, full of joy in his circumstances, his heart for the gospel advance is at the center of his aspirations. It strengthened the brethren, strengthened them. Last week we saw our lives culminate in the glory of God in that prayer And that's what's going on here. Paul is living for God and he's making God look really good and he's worthy to trust and he's worthy to die for and the brethren are being strengthened by this faith. I remember reading about the five Wheaton graduates who were killed in Ecuador by the Aka Indians, Jim Elliott, and an absolute outbreak of missionary service came from that because of this courage to go and die for the gospel of Jesus Christ and the seed of the martyrs spread and it strengthens the world to take the gospel. Paul's rejoicing. You might have shut my mouth, but you've opened a thousand more. His circumstances, his response to them have had a powerful impact on the saints in Rome. Your response to your prison cell this morning matters. Your broken, humble trust with tears to persecution and attack and suffering can strengthen the saints to be all the more bold in their proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ and his absolute sufficiency. But Paul was never one who would just put his head in the sand. Uh, He was not an optimist no matter what he was looking at. I struggle with that. He shares something that reveals the heart of him, this man, and the centrality of the gospel even further. So I want you to see that the facts are the gospel is spreading and it's strengthening the believers. Now he's going to move into, though, the the motives. I want you to come. There's something really good to learn from this little section is is the motives. And in verse 15 through 17, um, I, I just, if you diagram this out, 
I don't know if any of you did line, line sentence diagramming when you were going through school. It, it's, a great, it's a great thing to do. So there, if you look at the diagram, there's, there's two subjects, some. So there's some who preach and there's some who preach. So you got the same subject, same verb, but there's some who are preaching, he says, out of envy and strife, out of selfish ambition, and, and, and then some others are preaching out of goodwill and out of love. And so you got these two groups with two completely different motives. There, there's some preaching, some preaching, but different motives completely. One's trying to destroy Paul, and, and one's trying to, to, to bless him and encourage him in his trial. So the first question I ask is, who are these people trying to hurt Paul? Why do they want to hurt him? Don't you think it would, it's just got to be false teachers? And a lot of commentaries said it's the Judaizers because he calls them dogs. But I think that misses what's going on here because the message they're preaching from all we can draw from this text is right. They're preaching a true gospel. They're, they're, they're preaching Jesus Christ for salvation. Why do I say that? Well, in Galatians 1.7, Paul writes, he says, only there are some who are disturbing you. And this is the Judaizers. And they want to distort the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they are distorting the gospel. But even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema. Let him be consigned to judgment. Let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, let him be accursed. If this, if this group was preaching a false gospel, Paul would have laid it out there. And he doesn't even mention it. So more than likely, these people um, are preaching not from a pure heart. They might be preaching a, a pure message, but not a pure heart. So more likely, I'm going to say at best, they're Christians. And at worst, they're professing Christians and Galatians, Paul talks about selfish ambition and those who live in it as a way of life, he says, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then those who walk in the flesh who are Christians, he says, could have jealousy. So a believer can have jealousy and strife and struggle. There's a difference between being characterized by it and having a battle with it. So it, it could be either in our text. <clears throat> well, my question then is why? would a Christian want to cause Paul distress in his imprisonment? And so you got to really be off to do that. But the answer is all we're told is this. They're doing it out of envy. They're doing it out of strife. And that Greek word means rivalry. So there's, there's a rivalry going on with Paul and they're doing it out of a selfish ambition. And we don't get any more information than that. You can imagine all the speculation that's going on. Um, so I'm going to add one more speculation because I don't know. But here's my guess, most probable. Selfish ambition before the New Testament, this word meant self-seeking pursuit of a political office by unfair means. And so you're, you're seeking a political office in a wrong way. You, you want esteem. You want uh, to be noticed. You want self-honor. It's used in Philippians 2.3. Do nothing from selfish or selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. It's, it's not looking out for the interest of others, but for yourself. And so maybe then it's jealousy of Paul. And as I'm trying to think through, what, what would that be? Well, there's a church in Rome, and there's people who've been ministering there, and maybe the overseers of the church. And now Paul comes and just great success. And, and everybody's going out to Paul to hear him teach, and they're getting saved, and mighty things are going on. And, and, and I, I want my place. I want my preeminence. I want to advance myself. The old green monster came out. It's as old as Cain and Abel. And Matthew were told that they delivered up Jesus because of jealousy, because of jealousy, they, John the Baptist's followers come to him and, and they're, they're saying so many people are going out to Jesus and John just stops them and says, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's sanctification. And so my thought is no way in the church. Whitfield, one of the greatest evangelists 
in the last 500 years was scorned by the church and rejected as 30 and 40,000 people were gathering in fields to hear the man preach. Spurgeon was mocked, and some said he was just an emotional actor. Jealousy of the success of others is common. They just make a pattern of putting down preachers who God's using. I hear people mocking John MacArthur, John Piper, R.C. some of the greatest leaders that we've had over the last 50 years. And it's just my calling is to put them down, to put myself up. And you are? They do it. They do it not out of pure motives. It's not pure. It's not free from ulterior motives. And this other motive is stirring up trouble for Paul. They want to put salt in his wounds while he's in prison. Maybe to give him a sense of frustration that he's restricted in the situation. Maybe to bring the officials down harder. Maybe it's to get people back to, to them and not to Paul. As I was trying to figure out, how did the preaching of Christ, how would that hurt Paul? You know what jumped out at me? So little was shared about this personal rivalry. He doesn't get into it. It's just the gospel's advancing by these who are wanting to cause me distress. I wanted details and he didn't give any. <laughs> his focus is just the gospel. Not on his hurt, not on his pain, not on his sadness. That doesn't seem to be what's taking up Paul's heart. And all I could think of is if I was writing this letter, I, I would have gave you three chapters on those turkeys. I think I would have gave you their name, their address, and their mother's names. But for Paul, there's something bigger than his circumstances and even people attacking him and trying to harm him. The glory of God and the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you just couldn't get the man's heart off of that. Which leads me to our concluding thought. The facts, the motives, and the conclusion. What then? Verse 18. The fact that Christ is being proclaimed in Rome from wrong motives from bad motives, sinful motives, and it's also being proclaimed by loving motives. What then? I imagine all the ears of the Philippian congregation are perked up. I hope yours are. What then? Maybe they expect Paul to say, put them out. Have nothing to do with them. What then? Paul's joy has been brought low by his so-called brothers doing this to him. The assaults of friends are way harder than the attacks of enemies. What then? Well, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Every circumstance, prison, every wrong motive to do him harm, I only care that the name of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. I just want Jesus lifted up because he's a savior. He's a savior for sinners. I don't care what happens to my ministry. I don't care about my name. I don't care about my reputation or my distress. I just want the name above every name heralded. That was the ground of this man's joy. Christ is proclaimed. The gospel cannot be stopped by chains or by people trying to destroy you. It can just give wings to your message and the spread of the gospel, again, the seed of the martyrs. For Sean Killian Spurgeon, our only business is to cry, behold the Lamb. It takes away the sins of the world. We must put the advance of the gospel at the center of our aspirations. My life is to lift up Jesus Christ. And in every circumstance, I want that to be used to lift up Jesus. 
He's altogether lovely and he is beautiful and he's a savior. Application, I probably don't need to make any. You heard enough? (laughs) I'm gonna make it anyways. Okay, I only have eight points. Put your seatbelts on, brethren. This one has just sat on me all week and I hope it'll sit on you. Have you ever just really surrendered your life to the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or are you secretly just trying to build your own kingdom? Before judgment day honesty, before God. To just surrender your life to the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I see in Paul so deeply. Second, can I really grow into a place where my circumstances are not seen from a temporal mindset and space, but to Philippians 1.6, that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. God is using everything in my life as a way to put the name of Jesus Christ on display. We can grow into that by the grace of God. Thirdly, does my life and response to my circumstances strengthen anyone's faith and courage? I watch my brother Mike walk in and I say, yes. Yes, it does. I think what jumped out at me, fourthly, Have I counted the cost of truly following after Jesus Christ? Have you bought an American lie or have you counted the cost to die to yourself and your own agenda and your own program and live for God's? What is at the center of your aspirations? What makes your thermometer go up or down? Six, how do you respond when someone's out to hurt you or has? There's much to learn from Paul in this passage. Number seven, are you jealous of the gifts of another? They're just gifts from God. No one should ever boast of any gift that they have because it has nothing to do with you. It's from God for his good and his building up of the kingdom. It's a shame to us all that we could do the highest and best thing of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ with a sinful motive. God have mercy on us. And then my circumstances, God is at work in each one of our hearts and he's growing and he's making us new. And there are times when he strikes hard and deep and often And I just want to make sure, can you sit with someone and weep with those who weep and not be so uncomfortable with a hard providence that you gotta fix it right there and and usually say something that harms them and hurts them? Can you just sit in what God's doing in your brother or sister's life and let them journey? Because there's gonna be times when the joy is just that I got out of bed again and they're going to have tears running down their face, and that's okay. There's a season for everything under the sun, and there's a time to grieve and not fix them and pray and wait and let God do his perfect work in their heart. 2 Timothy 2.8, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead and a descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, that they also may obtain the salvation, which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. May the gospel and its proclamation be at the center of our aspirations. God, make me into a person who loves Christ being proclaimed more than my own freedom, a jail cell, or being treated well by other people. And then may grace and peace 
be with you to live this way because none of us can do this apart from the grace of God teaching us how to, to, to trust him and rejoice in the circumstances that you sit in this morning that he's gonna use them for gospel advance and gospel conformity. I need grace and I pray for grace and peace for every one of you to have that, that we would make Christ look really, really good by the way we trust him. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for this passage. My heart breaks at it. Thank you for the surgery that you've done in my own heart. God, let the center of every heart here this morning be that Jesus Christ be lifted up and be proclaimed and people would call on his name and be saved. God, thank you for such a glorious gospel. Thank you for such a sweet Christ. God, set our hearts in this sweet, beautiful place. We need grace to not try to build our own kingdom and not try to control our own lives and circumstances. Lord, help us to surrender and trust and lift you up in day-to-day providences in life. Lord, thank you. Give us hearts like this, we pray. Amen.